Hello, this is our second video um, looking at the Book of Acts, or you had that cluster of, of three short videos dealing with the first 10 chapter of Acts, and this video is going to deal with the remainder of Acts and a, a little bit of an introduction into what are called the Pauline epistles or letters uh, in the New Testament that are associated with um, Paul. So, as I mentioned in those earlier videos, one way of thinking about the Book of Acts its official title is the Acts of the Apostles. So the apostles are, by and large, Jesus' disciples, his closest followers, who then become the leaders of the early Christian movement. There is some bit of difference uh, in that. There's uh, some, some small changes in terms of who makes up the apostles, who makes up the disciples. But primarily, it's that group. I suggested a couple alternate ways of thinking about the Book of Acts. One we discussed earlier uh, around the day of Pentecost is if the Gospels are the Gospel of, of Jesus, the Acts of Jesus uh, in terms of salvation, um, the Book of Acts in many respects is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So in, 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 the, in the Book of Acts, we see this Spirit from God kind of coming into and dwelling within individuals and giving them the power to do um, ministry in ways similar to Jesus, both in terms of having wisdom that, that, that they would not have otherwise had, um, success in terms of conversion and whatnot that they would not have otherwise had, and even miracles that, that we see um, some of the followers of Jesus, some of the apostles having the ability to perform miracles in ways very similar to Jesus had done. To how Jesus had done. So a second, uh, you know, or first alternative title or a second title I suggested kind of related to this book is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I also suggested a third way of thinking about the book of Acts, the Acts of Peter and then Paul. So um, while there's quite a number of apostles, really the, the primary focus of the book is on two individuals and, and the ministry that they are a part of. The first being Peter, who is one of Jesus's close followers. Uh, Peter, who denies Jesus three times the night of his arrest, who, who Jesus speaks to after the resurrection. Um, that Peter features prominently in the first 10 chapters of the book. Um, but then he kind of fades away. And another individual who is mentioned early in the book of Acts and then he disappears for quite a while and then returns is a, a man named Paul. And, and kind of we're going to focus today on Paul, what Paul does, his conversion, um, his ministry, and this, this scene called the Council in Jerusalem, which happens in Acts 15 and kind of ratchets up sort of the, the scene that we left um, in the last video with, which was um, Peter having these dr this dream where the gospel now begins to go to Gentiles. Well, with the Council of Jerusalem and the ministry of Paul, that, that inclusion of Gentiles fully into the, the early Christian movement really picks up steam, and we'll talk more about that toward the end of the video. So one of the confusing things about Paul is that his name, as described in the Gospels, is event, is initially Saul. Okay, so so like you know, earlier on we had Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, Sarai, whose name's changed to Sarah. Um, here we have Saul, who later becomes Paul, and and one kind of idea behind this is that Saul would have been uh, that really it's sort of the same name only under um, kind of Jewish and Greek or Roman versions of it, you know, so um, like Ho um, like John in English and Juan in Spanish, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to think of, of names that it's the same name, but if you're speaking in a different language, you you change it slightly, right? So so Saul, when we first meet him, is is not at all a follower of Jesus. We have no evidence Paul never makes any suggestion that he met Jesus during Jesus' lifetime or had any interaction with Jesus' ministry. He is certainly not a follower of, of Jesus. And in fact, when, when Saul first comes on the scene, the very first instance 
is he is watching approvingly. He's actually kind of holding the cloaks of the Jewish men who kill a prominent Christian, Stephen. And they stone him to death, and Saul watches holding their cloaks and approves of what's happening. Um, he later is on the scene around his conversion, where he is actually working for the Jewish religious leaders who are now kind of in open hostility to followers of Jesus. And he's been given basically like an arrest warrant. Um, and, and he is going to the city of Damascus to arrest Jews who are following Jesus and bring them to Jerusalem to be tried as, as heretics, kind of as, you know, as blasphemers, similar to how Jesus had faced trial the night of his arrest for, for um, committing religious blasphemy. So, so Saul at this point is, is not only not a follower of Jesus, not a friend of Jesus, but adamantly opposed to all things in the Christian movement, right? And, and as he is on the way to Damascus, he has the experience. We're kind of like all of a sudden, walk, you know, riding a donkey down the road. Um, he's blinded by this light. Um, He's, he's blinded by a kind of a sudden light, and, and a voice from heaven speaks to him. And it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and somehow what, what Saul recognizes is that this is not the voice of any of these individual Christians that he's out to arrest, but this is the voice of Jesus himself, and, and that, um, that Jesus is in fact real, um, is in fact who he had claimed to be, and, and Saul is kind of converted in an instant. He's blinded by this, this bright, bright light for a, a number of days. He cannot see until a Christian comes and prays for him and his sight is returned to him. But he has this instantaneous conversion, right? So whereas, like if you, we didn't focus on this when we were discussing the Gospels, but if you, if you look at, for example, Peter, in the Gospels, Peter is, he meets Jesus one afternoon while fishing. Jesus says, come follow me. And then it seems to take G Peter quite a while before he begins to realize and believe in who Jesus is, right? After, after they've been together for months and months, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, I, I think you're the son of God. I think you're the Messiah. Um, but that seems to be kind of a gradual process. You know, perhaps looking like, you know, some of us that maybe grew up in church or were around church for quite an extended period of time before formally kind of becoming a Christian or, or we kind of became Christians gradually, maybe not even able to say the day or time when when you did. Um, that that would be me. I, I grew up in a church attending family. Um, I, I can't really tell, you know, a day where I... I wasn't a Christian yesterday, and today I decided to be. It just kind of always was present and sort of grew in my life and in my heart. Paul, on the other hand, is 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 much more instantaneous. Um, the, this sudden moment of conversion. Um, he is violently opposed to Jesus, doesn't believe Jesus is real, thinks followers of Jesus are heretics. Um, and then suddenly, because of this revelation, boom, he, he is now a Christian. He does not event immediately become a preacher, however. It actually takes him several years of kind of learning the Christian message. He, he travels and talks to, to a number of the Christian leaders, a number of people that have been eyewitnesses. He, he studies for quite a while. And then eventually, however, begins to preach, begins to um, travel around, at first, kind of the Jewish world of Judea, and preach the gospel of video, he eventually starts kind of reaching further out and, and going into more kind of Greek um, towns and cities as opposed to staying within primarily Jewish communities. And that that movement is important. So, so Peter, with the dream he had about the animals and then going to Cornelius' house, Peter cracks the door open, as I said in the last video. He he introduces the idea that, that maybe Gentiles, maybe non-Jews are going to be a part, maybe they're going to be welcomed into this ministry of Jesus' just like Jews are. Peter introduces that. But, but for Peter, that never goes beyond a small 
you know, that, that's always kind of a small piece of his ministry. For Paul, however, very quickly that becomes, the, this ministry to Gentiles very quickly becomes central to what he's about, right? So most kind of historians of the New Testament think that what Saul likely would do would be to come to a town. He, he would go first to the synagogue, right? So when he would arrive in a community, he would first attempt to go to Jewish places of gathering, Jewish places of worship, and talk there about Jesus. Um, and, and if there were Jews that were interested in, in Jesus' message, interested in becoming followers, he, he would convert them. Um, but he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't stay limited to that. Like, like once that was kind of finished, or once he was rejected by the Jewish community, he would stay in a, in a town, in a community, and talk to anyone that was interested. Um, and, and, and who he would talk to would be non-Jews, to Greeks, to Romans. And, and what begins to happen is he has converts, people that are, are hearing this message and converting. Now, one of the things that has, has already been happening, there have been Gentile convert, converts from the very beginning, but one of the signs of the signs that you were a faithful Jew in covenant relationship with God, dating all the way back to Abraham, if you are a male, is that you are circumcised, right? And so circumcision is kind of a, a small surgical procedure done to your penis that um, for Jewish young men is done just a few days after birth. But if you're a Gentile and wanted to convert to Judaism, you would be circumcised as an adult, right? So, so from time to time, there weren't huge numbers, but there were some gen, you know, Gentiles that would convert to the Jewish faith as men and they would get circumcised. So as Gentiles begin to come, become followers of Jesus, initially that's also what's happening. Because remember, at first, this Christian movement is still part of Judaism, right? The very first Christians did not see themselves as, as having left Judaism and starting a new religion, but that they were a new version or they were the completion or the extension of the Jewish faith. And so initially, as Gentiles are coming in, if, if a Gentile adult male wants to become a follower of Jesus, they would be circumcised and they would kind of begin to, to follow Jewish religious practice, including you know, eating Jewish foods, foods, observing kind of Jewish religious you know, holidays and whatnot, but doing it under the context of this is, this is because I am now one of a Jesus follower. So... A thing is happening with Paul that becomes very controversial. So, so we talked a little bit when we were discussing Acts 2, this, this idea of like the Holy Spirit kind of out of nowhere coming and falling upon. Like scripture will talk about it, it kind of coming upon like a wave. You know, like if you've ever been maybe at a concert or watching a movie or listening and all of a sudden like a wave of emotion just overtake and you're not quite sure where it came from. And, and like at one moment you're calm and you're just listening or watching, and the next minute you're you're uh, either like you're tingling with excitement or, or you're beginning to cry or weep, and, and you you're like what just happened? Um, this coming of the Holy Spirit seems to be like that. Like it's kind of unpredictable. Um, humans don't necessarily know it's about to happen, and then all of a sudden here they're feeling moved by this Holy Spirit. They begin to speak in tongues, which is sort of this spiritual kind of worship ability um, that, that we'll hopefully talk a little bit more when we get to Paul's letters. Um, but initially, that is happening to, to Jews, right? To Jewish Christians, and they're having this anointing of the Holy Spirit or receiving the Holy Spirit. But a strange thing is happening with Paul. So Paul is out there. He's preaching to people. Uh, preaching to Gentiles, to Romans, to Greeks, they're believing the gospel, and before they are able to get circumcised, the Holy Spirit is coming upon them. So Paul isn't asking, praying that that happen. Paul isn't some. Paul doesn't have control of the Holy Spirit. It's not Paul that's saying, "Okay, I, 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 this circumcision thing is stupid. Let's just bypass it." But God seems to be doing it. The Holy Spirit seems to be. These Gentiles are all of a sudden having this same kind of spiritual, mystical experience that Jewish Christians are, um, and they're doing it in the wrong order. 
right? So if if I if we were in class, I would I would draw up like here's Jesus, here's you, and initially there's this barrier in between, and the barrier is circumcision. That if you want access to Jesus, you you first need to go through circumcision and Judaism. That's the access point, right? And, and what is happening as Paul's doing ministry is that that barrier or that access point is is being removed, and and people are just having this direct encounter after Paul preaches to them of Jesus. They're having this this emotional, spiritual experience with the Holy Spirit. And that causes quite a controversy, right? Like the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem think Paul is maybe doing it wrong. Like maybe he's he's a he's a heretic. He's he, you know, he really wasn't part of the original group in the first place. He wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus. Maybe he's screwing it up. And, and, and they're worried about him. So they call Paul to Jerusalem. And the story of that takes place in Acts 15. And for your exam, it is called the Council in Jerusalem. So what this means is um, kind of all of the leaders of the early Christian movement, all Jews who decided that Jesus was the Messiah, um, gather together and they basically kind of put Paul on trial, right? So Paul comes and he explains, they're like, what are you doing out there, Paul? What, what's the deal? And, and Paul explains what's happening. Like I, I was preaching to people and this is, you know, the holy, well, let me just read it for you. So Peter gets up, Peter talks about how he had had his experience, um, you know, how he had begun sharing, you know, to, with the Gentiles and they could come in. Um, but but Peter was still kind of doing it under kind of the guise of, but yeah, but first you'll be circumcised, right? And then, then you'll become a Jew and then you'll become a follower of Jesus. And that's not, that's not what Paul is doing. So in, in verse 15, and Paul also has this friend Barnabas who's been doing ministry with him. So in verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them, right? So, you know, kind of basically defend yourself. Tell us, tell us why what you're doing is not wrong. Tell us what's happening out there. So Barnabas and Paul tell them stories of, we went to this town and we were preaching and, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came on these Romans, came on these Gentiles. And we, we couldn't stop it. It just was happening. Um, they even bring some of these Gentiles with them uh, to kind of tell their own story. So they're gathering testimony about what is happening. And then when they finished, James, who was very likely, or at least potentially Jesus' brother, who's the leader of the Jewish church. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described, Simon Peter, how God first intervened to choose a people for his name among the Gentiles. And then he interprets scripture. And then, you know, it is written in the prophets. After this, I will return and re rebuild David's fallen tent, his fallen glory, King David. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, so that the rest of humankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. So this is a passage from Amos, the prophet Amos, let justice roll down like a mountain. Um, but all of a sudden James goes, you know what? Like we remember a Bible passage where it seems to suggest that God was going to bring that after the Messiah came, God was going to bring the Gentiles in also. And they had, so it had always been in scripture, but they felt they had kind of missed it. And there's there's actually a, a number of questions about this passage um, because James is reading from the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, and not the Hebrew version. In the Hebrew version, it that, that passage about the Gentiles coming in um, does not sound nearly as friendly. It sounds almost like they'll be coming in, they'll be brought in as slaves, as prisoners. Whereas in the Septuagint, they will come in to worship. And so, so James is reading the Septuagint, he's reading this passage, they've heard these stories, and then they all kind of get together and talk about it. All right? so, so there's all kinds of interesting things 
about like what what they're doing is discerning right so, so one of the roles of christians is how do we understand what the bible is telling us how do we understand what god wants us to do in any situation like how do we what does god want us to do in response to the coronavirus what does god want us to do in response to a war that maybe comes here and there you know what does god want us to do with lgbt folks like like how do we know especially if the bible doesn't mention the specific situation we're doing with well what christians call that that figuring this out is discernment so discernment is is kind of a process it, it typically involves many people not just like i don't just sit in my room and decide for myself like i gather with a group of other christians i read the bible i i look at what god is doing like here's the situation here's stories here's experience contributing um, how has the church thought about this question in the past, right? So in this case, well, how, how have Jews thought in the past? Well, in the past, we thought Gentiles had to be circumcised. We have Torah that suggests that. We have the story of Abraham and where circumcision becomes part of being a Jew, and we have Torah. But we also have this passage in Amos that says Gentiles are going to be brought in. And we have these experiences. Paul is telling us stories. Barnabas is telling us stories. We've seen, we've met some of these Gentiles who they seem to be Christians just like us, even though they weren't circumcised. And so they kind of put all of this stuff together and then talk and pray about it for a period of time. And that talking and praying, after gathering all the evidence, the evidence of scripture and tradition and experience and thinking, leads them to describe Christian discernment, right? And what is amazing is that at the end of this discussion, they decide that God is doing something new. That even though for, the, for over a thousand years, they have felt, because they have read it in scripture, that the way to for men to enter into a covenant with God was through circumcision, and that they, they didn't say we were wrong to have done that in the past, that, that circumcision was always a mistake. They don't say that at all. They go like, no, our ancestors and, and us previously, we had understood scripture to tell that this is what God was asking us to do. But in light of this new situation, in light of this new evidence, we believe God is doing a new thing, right? Right. And so coming out of the council in Jerusalem, they tell Paul, go back out there and keep talking to G Greeks and Romans, and they don't have to be circumcised anymore. Like, like we, we no longer believe that this action, that, that for over a thousand years, right, for over a thousand years, all Jews had been circumcised. Um, we now think that's gone. That God has removed that requirement and that now all that's required is, is belief in Jesus and baptism and then baptism with the Holy Spirit, right? And, and from that moment out, um, that, like if, if Peter kind of um, is a little crack in the dam of, of keeping Gentiles out of covenant relationship with God, if if you know, Peter's vision with the animals and then going to, to Cornelius' house, if that kind of cracks the door open, well, the, the council in Jerusalem just blows the door completely off its hinges. The dam is now completely broken. And now we begin to see Gentiles entering into the, the Christian movement in huge numbers, right? And, and within 30, 40, 50 years, um, the percentage, like if the early percentage is the vast majority of followers of Jesus are Jews, and there's a small number of Gentile converts. By the end of the book of Acts, that's well on its way to being completely the opposite. That now the Christian movement still has Jews, still has you know Jews that believe Jesus is the Messiah, but it's primarily uh, a Gentile religion, and that is going to just pick up speed, right? So the fact that that you attend a Christian college and, and that you, you, you know, drive through any town in America and you see Christian church after Christian church, you still see Jewish synagogues periodically, but, but what you mostly see are Christian churches all over the place. That, 
almost certainly would not have happened without the council in Jerusalem, right? Like without the council in Jerusalem, um, the, the early Christian movement would remain a part of what is a fairly small world religion, Judaism, right? And, but, but when the Council of Jerusalem opens the doors for Gentiles to freely convert to Jesus without first entering Judaism, um, you really are setting the stage for, for Christianity's birth as a religion. Now, there's some other events that also contribute to that, some really unfortunate political events, some kind of fights between Jewish Christians and, and Jews. Um, but, you, you know, once the Council of Jerusalem is finished, really the, the momentum is going and the die is kind of cast, right? And, and so Paul, you know, if Peter is kind of the early leader of the Jewish Christians, Paul becomes the evangelist to... Um, and the one who takes the Christian message, the Christian gospel, to the Gentile world, to the Greek and Roman world, and setting the stage for Christianity's growth in the first in the Roman Empire, and then eventually becoming kind of a world dominant uh, religion. Um, and, but it all emanates from this council in Jerusalem. Okay, so so leaving that, so that's in Acts fifteen. So leaving that, um, most of the rest of the book of Acts basically talks. It, it's not exclusively Paul, but it's largely Paul's first his travels, and then Paul's eventually going to get arrested, and, and we'll talk a little bit about why he's arrested, and his his what happens to him after he's arrested, he's eventually sent to Rome because he wants to appeal to the emperor about his case. But but first, I want to talk about Paul's travels. So so Paul proceeds to kind of go on a series of preaching tours, right, evangelistic tours, where he goes from kind of Greek town to Greek town, many of which are now in Turkey. Um, at, at this point, Turkey would have been part of the Greek world and then part of the Roman world after the Romans conquered the Greeks. Now it, it would be Turkey. So Antioch, well, is, is, is kind of the hinterland, the border of this, but Philippi, Ephesus, Corinth, um, several of these towns become books in the Bible. Ephesians is a letter that Paul writes to people in Ephesus. Um, but, but Paul makes these missionary journeys that sometimes last several years, where he, sometimes with partners, sometimes with this man Barnabas, sometimes with others, sometimes alone, travels from one town to another, preaching the Christian message. He will sometimes stay for a while, uh, at a time, but sometimes he stays just mere weeks, Sometimes as long as almost a year, sometimes he gets a job and works in these communities, but he stays long enough to establish a Christian church, right? And then once there's kind of an adequate group of converts, and they seem to kind of have their you know feet underneath them and be self-sustaining in terms of you know Christian worship and teaching each other about Jesus, encouraging each other, then he moves on to a new community to start a new church. Okay, but, but something happens along the way. So, so one of the things that you see with Paul, um, if we were in class, I would probably try to show a video of this, right? So you could, you could look this up on YouTube. Some of you have maybe seen it. Like if you've ever seen like at the circus or videos of old carnival acts or, or whatnot, plate spinners, right? So the, the key to plenty, spinning plates is like imagine kind of the table in front of class that I would I would typically have in Hoover 105. And a plate spinner would have like a several long sticks, you know, kind of long wooden poles. Um, and, and they would be kind of planted on the table. You might have six or eight or however many. Um, and then he would take a plate. And, and the pole kind of has some wobble to it. Like it, it's affixed to the table but it's, it's quite long, and, and it bends a little bit. It wobbles a little bit. And you would place the plate on it and get the plate spinning. Like if you've ever tried to spin a basketball on your finger or you know some ball on your finger, same principle, right? So you get the plate spinning, and the key is to balance it just right and give it enough energy that it, it's, it, it is rotating and it's making the stick vibrate and rotate as well. And for a while, it will do just fine. Like eventually you can let go and it will, it will keep spinning by itself. And then you go to the next plate and you start it spinning. And a really good plate spinner can do like six to 10 
you know, in a row, like you've got a ton of plates spinning up and down a row, right? But what happens, right? If you've ever watched this, you see it. If you know anything about science, things slow down, right? The, the momentum, the energy kind of gets dissipated. And, and after a while, what was at first kind of this tightly spinning plate that seems to be perfectly balanced begins to get wobbly, right? And, and it gets slower and slower. And if left to itself, it's going to collapse. So the job of the plate spinner is first to get all these 10 plates, 8 plates, however many, get them going, get them started. But then you have to kind of pay attention to the row, which ones are in trouble, right? And as soon as a, a plate starts to lose momentum, you have to run down and give it a little extra spin, get it going again, right? And, and, and you can do this as long as you have energy and attention to, to run up and down the line re-spinning plates. Like you could keep them going for hours. But but it's it's the spinner's job to move back and forth to the new, you know, okay, this plate's doing fine, I'm gonna skip it. That plate's doing fine. This one's in trouble, give it a little couple extra spins. Next one is really in trouble. I gotta give it a bunch of spins, right? And so running up and down the line spinning plates. I want you to think about that picture, right? So imagine in your head that like that's what Paul's doing right that each time he goes to a town and starts a church it's like starting a plate spinning right and he gets the church and he stays there long enough to get it going you know in some churches boom just a couple spins the things up and it's balanced perfectly and it takes off some of them it takes a little longer so he stays there longer but eventually each of these churches is left on their own like definitely he kind of gets these churches started and then he moves on to the next one. And then he gets that started. And eventually he's half as you know, half the way around to Rome, to Italy. You know, and he's he started in Antioch, he started in kind of Judea, but he's now traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles on foot, right, to, to get these things going. And then he hears about trouble, right? So we don't know if it's he receives letters or messengers, probably a mix of both, but word comes back to him. That plate number one is is in trouble. That plate that plate back in Corinth, they're starting to fight with each other. Or that plate in Philippi, you won't believe the crazy teaching they're they're doing. You know, like somebody came in and introduced some ideas that are totally not compatible with Christianity, and and they're really confused and, and in trouble. And the plate's starting to wobble, right? So Paul needs to help them. These are his churches. These are churches he started, he's very concerned about. He, he really wants to help them, but he doesn't know what to do. How, how do I how do I help these churches? And how do I how do I re-spin the plates? Right? Now this is not um he can't hop on an airplane. You know, I'll I'll just take a couple days, 48 hours, I'll fly back to Corinth and you know hold some meetings, preach a little bit, get things back under control. I'll be back in four or five days and it'll all be good. And it, it would take weeks and months for him to go to one of these churches, let alone several of them, right? And, and they all kind of eventually start having problems of one kind or another. So how is he going to help them? He can't physically travel back to each one to fix the problems that they have. So, I mean, some of you have already guessed what he does. He writes letters. He writes letters. So he's sitting in a new town. He's sitting, you know, in in Ephesus or Corinth or wherever it might be. And, and he's, he's, he's doing work and ministry in this new place. But word comes to him, either through a letter or through a messenger, that, you know, back, back where you were two years ago, that plate is in big trouble. Like, it is... They they they're fighting. Bad doctrine has introduced itself. Things are not going well. That that church is in trouble, and so Paul starts writing letters back to these churches, trying to help them. And the reason we know this is because we have these letters, right? Like like several of these letters that Paul writes back to these churches have made their way into the New Testament. So, so far, we've looked at five books of the New Testament. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The book of Acts, written by the author of Luke, Luke Acts. But it tells about the actions of the early church. But then the lar there's a large collection of books that come after that. Now, I'm going to send you a handout 
um, via, you know, over email um, t later today, kind of talking about some of those. But we have letters from Paul to either individuals that are leaders in some of these churches or to the churches themselves. And what these letters are, are Paul kind of writing back, trying to help people in the past with problems they're having. Okay, now, now a key thing, a key element to that. So this is going to be a variation on a phrase um, that we introduced at the beginning. Like at the beginning of the course, uh, over and over again, the first several class periods, you know, I said, before we can think about what the Bible has to say to us, we need to consider what it first said to them, to the early readers, you know, to the people that wrote these books and the first readers of these books. Similarly, um, before we read Paul's letters as timeless theology, and I'll talk about why I say that in just a moment, but before we can see Paul's letters as timeless theology for the church, we need to first understand that they were specific letters to specific people with specific problems. Okay, so, so here's, here's what that, why that's a slightly different phrase than the one that we had it in, you know, back in January. So, Paul's letters, especially from the Protestant Reformation on, um, you know, Paul's letters were important before the Protestant Reformation, before Martin Luther. But from Martin Luther on, there's this real sense that these letters that Paul wrote kind of become like the founding documents of Christianity. That, that yes, we have these stories of Jesus, and those are awesome, but... If you really want to know how to think about things as a Christian, we turn to Paul, right? And, and Paul is viewed as kind of like these letters almost become viewed as they're the first theological textbooks. You know, they're not just telling us, here's some cool things Jesus did, but like, here's why Jesus was important. Here's how we achieve salvation. Here's what it is to be a Christian. Here are things that Christians need to believe and, and, and kind of... Paul's letters are often seen as kind of the, the door or the, the original house of belief, of Christian ideas, Christian theology, of thinking about God, thinking about Christ and Jesus. Um, and, and they are rich resources in that regard. But the thing I'm trying to stress is Paul is not sitting around 40, 30 years after Jesus, 40 years after Jesus, saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invent Christian theology. I'm going to I'm going to create systematic beliefs one through twenty or however many things. I got you know systematic ideas that all Christians for all time need to believe. Like no, what Paul is doing is saying, hey, there's this group of thirty, fifty, a hundred people back in this town, Philippi, and they're really in trouble, and I need to help them, and they've got really specific problems. And, and I need to write a letter addressing their problems, right? So one of the things, one of the reasons why that's important is sometimes we sit down and think, like, if I were about to die tomorrow, you know, and, and, like, and, and I want to write to my daughters a letter of all the things that I think are important, you know, that I, I, would, I would sit down and just, you know, make a list of 50 things. Like, a, you've got to know all these things, and I'm writing them down for all time, and tell your, my, you know, my future grandchildren who, you know, you're not, you know, you don't have children at this point, but future generations, write all this stuff down, you know, copy it over and over. That's not what Paul is doing, right? So Paul is not in these letters trying to say, let me tell you everything that is important to know about Jesus. Right? He's not creating you know, a list of all the important beliefs. What he's doing is, here are important beliefs, here are important things I think and I think God is telling me to say to you about the exact problems you have right now. Right? So there's going to be some gaps, there's going to be some holes in, in the material that we have. Like we, we don't have every single idea that was in Paul's head. We don't have every idea that the early Christians thought was important. We really, in Paul's letters, have his thinking about the, the, the issues or the problems that were popping up in these specific places, right? 
So it's helpful. It, it, it fills in a lot of holes. And one of the things, you know, a couple things that Paul is doing, they have a lot of questions about who was Jesus? Was Jesus God? Was he human? Um, so it's kind of these early Christian beliefs of the incarnation, that Jesus was God and human flesh in one. We see Paul talking about that, addressing some of those kind of questions because they're confused. It's a very complex new idea, and they're trying to sort that out. So you see Paul talking about that. You see him talking about, like, why the cross? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Nobody expected the Messiah to die on a cross, and yet Jesus did. And, and, and what, what are the implications of that? And then he rose from the dead. So we see Paul talking a lot about salvation, a lot about, um, you know, the meaning of the crucifixion, the meaning of the resurrection. Um, they're also wondering, you know, like we used to really, really place a lot of emphasis on the law. And, and as Jews, we were very concerned about following the law. But it seems like Jesus doesn't care so much about that. So Paul wrestling a lot with this idea of how much our works or our good behavior how important is that, or is it just important that we believe that God has offered us mercy or grace for free? Um, so these are clearly ideas that Paul thinks are important, and, and they're confusing for a lot of these churches he's writing to, but these are not the only things that the first Christians thought and taught, right? They're just the ones that happen to be relevant to those specific letters. So, um, I encourage you to, you know, Paul's letters are beautiful at often points. Um, they're profound. They have had a, a massive influence on 2,000 years of Christianity, particularly for Protestants, um, partly because Martin Luther has a, a very profound kind of revela revelatory experience while teaching uh, the book of Galatians and, and the book of Romans. And, and that really has a big impact on him. So Martin Luther spends a lot of time in Paul's letters, as do reformers that follow him. So the Protestant Reformation gets really highly influenced by Paul. Um, but he's not setting out to set in stone theology for all time. He is more writing, you know, the kind of letter, or like imagine an email that you wrote you know, you might write to your friends or you might write to your parents, you know, you know and, and you might say a lot of really important big things in that email, but you're not saying every single thing that you think about the, whatever topic it is, it is. You're just saying the things that are germane or relevant to that particular conversation. And that's kind of what Paul is doing. Another thing that um, that is important to remember with Paul's letters is we are only seeing one at most, one side of the conversation, right? So uh, like to picture this, imagine, we don't know what they wrote. You know, we don't know exactly what they asked that spurred Paul to write this letter. We don't know, we have hints or clues as to some of the crises that are going on. And, and we're gonna look at some specifics in relation to that in the next video. Um, but we don't, we're guessing a little bit. And, and we don't have any copies of letters to Paul. All we have are copies of Paul's letters to others, right? So, so we're, we're, we're le it's kind of like you're sitting, you know, in a public space, the Canyon Commons or, you know, you know, classroom before class starts or wherever it might be, airport, you know, terminal, and you're listening to somebody loudly talk on the phone, but they have earbuds on, so you can't hear what the other person is saying. Right, so so you can kind of make some guesses. You know, Paul, oh, I think this man is talking to his wife, um, or it sounds like this this you know woman's talking to employees of hers. Oh, it sounds like she's a doctor and she's giving medical. You know, like you can make guesses based on what they're saying, but but you're only hearing at best half of the conversation. So when we read Paul's letters, that's part of what's going on. We're never we don't have the full conversation, right? We don't have the back and forth. We just have Paul's side of the conversation at best, right? And, and we're left guessing. So, so that's a little challenge as we read, as, as we try to figure out the context, is we have clues. And, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians specifically as an example 
of how sometimes there's very clear clues. I mean, sometimes the letters are pretty obvious as to what's going on, but, but other times much less so. Um, and we also don't have every letter Paul wrote, right? Again, one of the things we're going to see with First and Second Corinthians, which is a collection of two letters to one church, in them, Paul is going to reference other letters, right? In 1 Corinthians, the first letter that we have from Paul to this church, we have him saying, in this earlier letter I wrote you. Now the church has lost that letter. But like that first letter has not survived through history, right? All that Christians have had for almost 2,000 years is these two. But there's hints, there's hints in Corinthians that at one point there were likely four different letters at least that Paul wrote, right? So um, not only are we listening, eavesdropping on a conversation where we're only hearing um, half of it, you know, we're not hearing whoever is speaking to the person that we're next to, we're not hearing what they're saying to Paul. Every once in a while, Paul walks out of the room and says things that we don't hear at all, right? Because there's, it seems obvious that he also is writing other letters, either to this specific church or to other churches or people, and that we don't have those, right? Like the, there's no, no one believes that the letters that are in the New Testament from Paul are the sum total of his correspondence. He seems to have been somebody that did quite a bit of writing, um, and and that's a way he communicated with past churches, past relationships. And we have some of it, but but this isn't all of it, right? So, so uh, as we're reading this, as we're talking about this the next several class, you know, videos, um, we're, we're guessing, we're making some guesses, okay? So that's an important thing about Paul's letters. Before their timeless theology for us, they're specific personal letters to specific personal people with specific questions and problems. And, and, and we're left to kind of tease out of that, out of that specific correspondence, what is the theological takeaway for us for all time? Okay, so one last quick comment about Paul, and then we're going to wrap up for this morning. So a thing you need to understand about Paul, part of why Paul is the, the perfect person for this is he was a Pharisee, right? So, so, you know, remember the Pharisees are Jews and very concerned with purity. Because of that great concern, they were kind of the equivalent of lawyers in, in the first century, in that they had studied Torah better than, more than anyone, right? So Fer Paul is an expert in the Old Testament. He has studied, he has memorized, he, he, you know, he knows backwards and forwards everything you can know about Judaism and, and, and the Old Testament. So he's an expert in the law, right? He... he he was kind of a prodigy as a young man. Like he, he was maybe skipping a grade or two in Torah school and going off to college at fifteen. You know, like he's he was a star. He was a National Merit Scholar. Like he he was an all star academically in Judaism. He he knew it. But his father was also a Roman citizen, and so that's part of Paul's story. Part of why he some of his travels um, are related to. As a Roman citizen, not just a Jew, but a Jew who was also a Roman citizen, Paul has certain rights. And he can request, I don't want my case tried here. I want the emperor in Rome to hear my case. Any Roman citizen could do that. And Paul does that. So, so part of what happens in his lifetime and in the book of Acts is Paul gets, he travels on his way to Rome because he's arrested and, and he's going to be put on trial. So he's a Roman citizen, but there also seems to be clear that he was not only educated in Torah, he was educated in Greek philosophy, right? So he's he's kind of like, remember Moses was kind of a bicultural person. He was very Jewish. You know, his mother had raised him as an infant. He had probably heard all the Jewish stories, but he was also raised in Pharaoh's palace. In some ways, Paul is kind of similar. He's, you know, half of his brain is totally Jewish. He's very educated in Torah, but he's also educated in Greek philosophy and, and, and kind of Greek ideas of, of law and, and matter and how the world works. And so Paul is going to be this unique person 
to kind of bring the world of Jewish thought and the world of Greek thought together and to create what becomes early Christian theology. And so early, so, so Paul, not only in his personal life, because he takes the gospel to Greeks and Romans, is he kind of this transitional figure, but even within his own person. Part of probably why he was successful doing that, taking the gospel to Greeks and Romans, is because he knew how they thought. He had credibility. He could speak in their language. He could speak in their on their terms because he he understands Judaism, but he also understands Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy. Able to kind of move back and forth between both thought work worlds. All right, so we'll have a third video coming later in the week where we'll start kind of talking about the specifics of some of Paul's letters. I'm also going to send you a handout that's going to cover some of that material as well. All right, thank you very much.